looking at the subject of the Sabbath, the Sabbath day today. Now, last week, we, uh, we finished up in chapter 2 with the words of Jesus. He was explaining to the Pharisees, to all the religious leaders, to these religious people, that he had come to do something new. He had come to do something new, and it was pointing to the new covenant. And we talked about that, and how Jesus had told these religious leaders that the work he had come to do required a new vessel. Because the new vessel, the old vessel, couldn't contain the new wine, and it required new wineskins. Because the work he was planning to do, that he had, before the foundations of the earth, planned to do, would burst those old vessels under the pressure of the new wine. And we looked at that, and, and you know, that's a, that's a beautiful thing, because what Jesus was pointing to was a fulfillment of the sacrificial system in himself, of the priestly system of Israel, of all of that being fulfilled, being replaced with something beautiful and something brand new. Jesus was pointing towards something of a new work, a new baptism, a new covenant, a new priestly system. Do you understand that? Yeah. Jesus was pointing to a new priestly system where all believers of God are the temple of God. Amen. And it's called also, every one of the believers of Jesus Christ would become the priests of God. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yeah. You and I are royalty, but we're also a royal priesthood. Jesus was pointing to this, that we would all be the temple of God, that we would be the priests of God. And I'll start with this. 1 Peter 2, you don't have to turn there. Today, I'll just warn you, you're going to need a Sabbath rest after this teaching. I'm just telling you, it's a little, you know, there's a lot in it. So uh, that's why if you need a seat cushion, speak now, okay? So, but 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 tells us this. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. How beautiful is that? You know? But we also know that Jesus, although he came to do a new work, he didn't come to destroy the old, and that's crucial, that's key. He came to fulfill it, to bring it to completion. Do you understand that? To bring it to completion. This is what Jesus was pointing to, that we were going to see um, some brand new thing that he was going to do, and it was going to be a marvelous work. And that's what he was pointing to then, and that's what we're going to see today. He's pointing to something, and that he has the authority to do this. Not only that, but Jesus is going to challenge these religious leaders once again. But today we're going to see he, they're, he's going to challenge them on something that was kind of the crux of everything for them, their biggest point of pride. He's going to challenge them on the Sabbath which under the rule of these keepers of the law had become an idol and had become this religious gar gobbledygook. You know, that, I don't think that's in the scripture. I don't think that's a Greek word, but it might be. I don't know. But we know that this topic is even debated within the Christian church. And I'm, I'm not expecting this to impact you the way it impacted me, but I want to share something with you. When I realized something about the Sabbath that hopefully I will be able to convey to you today, it radically altered my faith. Now, some of you probably already embrace what I'm going to share at the end of the teaching today. But for me, it radically altered my faith. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to address three questions, hopefully. I'm going to try anyway by the end of this teaching. Number one, what is the biblical Sabbath day? Number two, are Christians bound to observe the Sabbath? And then the third question I'm going to try to answer is, what day should the church worship the Lord? And so with that, let's dive in. Mark chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 23 through the end of the chapter, verse 28, and then we're going to look at this. Now it happened that he, speaking of Jesus, went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him? How he went through the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Help me to get out of the way. And God, just deliver your message to your people. Let your word do what your word does, Lord. Purify our hearts and our minds. Divide between the soul and the spirit. Let it, let it cut us and remove things that need to be removed, Lord. And God, let us also be encouraged. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Okay, so we see Jesus is here. He's walking on the Sabbath with his disciples, which, by the way, is the first problem. Because if you didn't know, and I'll talk about this a little later, but, you know, one of the Sabbath rules that these Pharisees had instituted is that you couldn't walk more than 2,000 minus one step. So 1,999 steps. That's all you could walk on the Sabbath. <laughs> you had to keep track of that, you know, and they didn't have technology. So just think about that. So here, him and his disciples are walking. And then the second problem is... Uh, they start pulling the grain and probably rubbing it in their hands, blowing away the chaff, and then eating it. And these Pharisees were angry about that. You could just hear it in the text. How dare this man let his followers break our rules, you know? Um, because understand, no one broke the rules of the Sabbath under the Pharisees' watch. At least not publicly, anyway. Because they would make your life miserable. The Pharisees had a lot of power, religious power, over this day. This, this thing, this Sabbath, had become their day to control people. You know, if you didn't hold to the Sabbath, they could ruin your employment. They could ruin your future, you know, job prospects. They could destroy your life. Even the Sadducees, which were no friends to the Pharisees, by the way, these two were kind of like enemies. There was a lot of division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I won't go into all that. I'm just thankful we don't see that in the church today. You know, there's no division. And so, um, but, you know, here's the thing. Even the Sadducees were of, would... Hold to the Sabbath, all the rules the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin laid down because they feared retribution. The Sabbath for the Pharisees had become a way to control people. This is what religion does. Man-centered religion always seeks to control people, to force them to comply to their rules under their control. Religious leaders will often create laws and rules and regulations for everyone else that you have to follow. You know, rules about eating, rules about what you can drink, you know, rules about where you can go to church, when you can go to church, how you have to give money. I mean, there are churches out there that call themselves Christians to some degree that'll come knock on your door collecting if you don't pay your tithe. You know, because that's what religion does. They'll often force service on other people and make them volunteer. You know, we call that voluntold. <laughs> that's not volunteer, you know what I mean? But there are whole religious systems out there that force people to comply, that force them to serve. They put a heavy guilt trip on them if they don't. It's exhausting. And these things and many more were a way just to control people, to force them to comply, to force them to do what these Pharisees said. And this is why it was such a threat. Jesus was such a threat. Because you've got to understand something. You know, when we think about why these Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus, do you know the premier issue was the Sabbath? That's how much of an idol the Sabbath had become. The Shabbat had become to the Pharisees. Now, before we go further, I want to cover John chapter 5. If you'll bear with me, turn your Bibles over to John chapter 5 because we're going to be there for a little bit. We're going to go through it in a bit of a narrative, so it should go pretty fast. But this story in John chapter 5, I'll start at verse 6, is so crucial to understand what we're talking about today. To understand everything that was going on and to understand why the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus. Now, this is a famous story. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. And remember, it's always up because Jerusalem is elevated. Um, you know, I, I remember talking to somebody in North Idaho when I drive up there. And they're like, don't you mean down because the elevation? I'm like, no, in modern times, we're in cars. We look at a map. It's north, so it's up. But in that day, everything was up to Jerusalem, no matter where you're at ge geographically, because it was higher elevation. But Jesus goes up to Jerusalem for a feast. And we know there's this story about the Pool of Bethesda. You've heard of that, right? Um, it had five porticos. It was very big. It was a huge. Now today, it's still there in the city of David. It's just not that, that big. There's a little bit of water there, but not much. But here's the thing. You know, there were a lot of Jewish fables and mysticism and superstition. There still are today, even in the church. But one of the stories was that the sick and the lame, if they would go to the pool of Bethesda, that an angel would once in a while stir up the water. And if you were the first one in the water, you would be healed. Now, we see no indication this is actually true. We don't see that this ever really happened. But it was a legend, and people believed it. And so Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda, and he meets this man who's there who'd been ill, who had been lame for 38 years. Just think about that. I mean, that's, that's a sickness. He'd been sick for 38 years, and he's laying on his bed next to the pool. And Jesus simply asks him in verse 6, he says, Do you want to be made well? You know, and Jesus still poses that question to all of us, doesn't he? You know? You know, salvation is a beautiful thing, but our Lord is a gentleman. You know, I won't go into the whole issue, but understand this. We were chosen before the foundations of the earth. 
we were predestined. I don't understand it because at the same time, God says we must, we must make a choice. Both are true because love cannot exist without a choice. Both are true. And I have yet to be able to define those so clearly that everyone can understand. I just trust it because that's what the word says. But here this man is asked, do you want to be made well? And notice this, he doesn't even really answer Jesus. He just tells him his position. His, he's a victim. Look at verse 7. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. He doesn't say, yes, please heal me. He tells Jesus, here's my excuse. You know, and, I, and I'm willing to have compassion on this because I've never been sick for 38 years. Maybe a little in the head, you know. Some of you guys, you know how I am. But, you know, this man had been through it. So I'm not judging that. But I would just say this, you know, he doesn't say yes, he doesn't say no. But we're going to find out he didn't even know who Jesus was. But this is interesting because look at verse 8. Jesus said to him, even without the man answering him yes or no, Jesus is still going to heal him because that's who our Lord is. Okay, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And verse 9, look at this. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Uh-oh. That day was the Sabbath. You know, it should have been an inspiring event. You know, if you knew somebody who'd been ill and lame for 38 years and Jesus walked up and healed them, do you think you'd be excited? Do you think you'd be like, wait a second, that's, that's pretty incredible. Right? Isn't that what you'd focus on? That's what I'd focus on. But the religious leaders aren't focused on that. Look at this. They're, they're perturbed because of one reason. Look at verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. <laughs> they didn't even care that this man had been healed. That this miraculous work had been done. They weren't even phased. They would have known this guy. They would have seen him laying around there. They knew he had been sick for probably, you know, all of their lifetimes. 38 years. They would have known. And yet that's not what they're focused on. They're focused on the fact that he's carrying his bed on the Sabbath and he's breaking their rules. If you think about that, what hardness of hearts does that take? You know, to see such an amazing miracle, this man for 38 years who had been ill, who had been sick, and now he's walking. Not just walking, he's carrying his bed. Which means strength was restored to him. But what hardness of hearts of the Pharisees to see that obvious work of God and disdain it because of their rules. But you know what? What a warning for us, huh? May we never be like that. You know, when we see God moving, and I mean really moving, I'm not talking about kooky, strange, ridiculous stuff. I'm talking about when you know it's a move of God, the Holy Spirit, may we never be like the Pharisees. Wait, may we never disdain those things. May we never become so legalistic that we just push those things away. May we never be those who put God in a box and say, nope, that's where God stays. You know, may we never be those who say, that's against the rules. <laughs> Put down both hands. That's voting twice, you know, or whatever. Look, let God move. Yeah. But let him move in your own life first. And don't put that pressure on anyone else. Let God move in their life the way he's moving in their life. Do you, do you understand? Each one of us have to account to him. But may we never be like the Pharisees. Where, may we never embrace legalism. But I just want us to look at this because to really understand just how bad this was, how corrupt Judaism had become, how corrupt these leaders had become, and how they had exchanged the truth of God for the religion of man, let's look at this. Look at this man's answer in such stark contrast because he's just humbly doing what Jesus told him to do, which, by the way, is another good lesson for us, right? When Jesus says to do something, we ought to do it. <laughs> but look at verse 11. He answered them, he said this, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Now I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, I can imagine. Look, I'm just telling you, the guy who healed me said, Pick up your bed, I'm going to pick it up. <laughs> I'm going to walk. Wouldn't you? Yeah. But then look at this. He didn't even know Jesus' name. 12, verse 12 and 13. Then they asked him, Who is this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Jesus healed him, didn't stick around for the glory and the credit, just walked off. There's another lesson, I guess. But it's pretty remarkable. Then, this is what I love. Jesus goes and finds this man in the temple. 
And you know, and I just want to say this, one of the things I was thinking when I was uh, studying this passage out is, you know, many times, and this is not a slight and I'm not criticizing anybody, but many times we'll say, I accepted Jesus, or I found the Lord. <laughs> That's not true. He accepted you, and he found you. You were the one lost. I mean, he always knew where you were at. He just was waiting, right? But I just, just think about that. Because, you know, it's almost like we're interviewing the Lord. Okay, what can you do for me? Uh, oh, you can save me from hell? Okay, I accept you. I accept your offer. In a sense, it's true. We receive a free offer of grace, right? And I, again, I'm not trying to nitpick. I'm not trying to be like the Pharisees here. But, you know, let's remember that. And I just love this because look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Apparently, this man's sin was caused, or his uh, sickness was caused by his own sin. And so Jesus is saying, okay, now you're healed, go and sin no more. But just as an encouragement, not all sickness, not all injury, not all things come from sin. Now, it does in a broad spectrum, right, the original sin. You know, when people say, why do bad things happen to good people, it's really not a valid question, because really there are no, there's none good, no, not one. But the real issue is sin itself is a real thing. The effects of the original sin, the effects of our sin accumulated, cause problems on this planet. And one day it'll all go away. You know, how amazing will that be? But here's the thing. This man was healed. Jesus tells him, go and sin no more. And then look at this. He goes back to the Pharisees. This is how much influence they had. But not only that, I give this guy a little credit. He's probably thinking in his mind, I need to tell the religious leaders. They obviously need to know who this man is. Such a miracle, such an amazing thing of God, I need to tell them. So verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. But then notice their response. Um, it wasn't, wow, this is an amazing miracle. Could this be of God? Is this Mashiach? Is this the Messiah? It wasn't that. It was none of that. What was their response? Look at verse 16. This is key. This is, this is the key understanding we need to take from this whole passage, really. For this reason, for this reason, verse 16, for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Do you understand what an idol the Sabbath was for these Pharisees? What an, what an issue of control it really was and power, religious power? And then look at Jesus. He gives them a response in verse 17 and 18. But when he gives them a response, they want to kill him even more. <laughs> he said, but Jesus answered them, verse 17, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Two main offenses. Primary offense, he broke their Sabbath. Secondary offense, he made himself equal with God. For those who say Jesus never claimed to be God in the scripture, many times he did. Remember in, what is it, John chapter 8, verse 58, I think? You can check me on that. Um, remember the declarative statement? They're talking to him and he said, Behold, Abraham was, I am. He's declaring he's the eternal one and he's declaring himself as the I am, the great I am. God Almighty. You know, not to mention in Revelation, he tells us he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. There can only be one beginning and one end. He's the first and the last. He is the I Am. And here, these Jewish leaders, let me tell you, they knew what he was saying. They knew he was declaring that he was equal with God, which means what? He was God. If you're equal with God, you are God. And they knew this. But notice this. That was a secondary offense. Jesus declaring that he's God. They were like, yeah, we'll kill you for that too. But really, we're really mad about that Sabbath thing. <laughs> Just think about that. Does that show you what kind of an idol the Sabbath was for them? This is how much these men depended on the Sabbath to keep people under their control. And now this man from Galilee, this redneck rabbi, because that's how he was looked at, just so you know. This guy from Galilee, supposedly a rabbi, a lowly carpenter, no less, is going to come and tell them, you know, about the Sabbath? Never mind that he's healing people and driving out demons. Never mind that he's doing all the things that Scripture said Mashiach, Messiah, would do. They didn't care about that because he broke their rules for the Sabbath. Their religious dogma, their rules, their control. It meant more to them than the truth of God. And might I say and add, 
May that never be us. You know, for centuries, the Jewish leaders have lorded the Sabbath over the entire nation of Israel. It still happens today. It still happens today, but in Jesus' time, it was really bad. And when you think about the fact that they put all these burdensome rules and laws and regulations upon regulation, it's literally exhausting. You have to count the steps you take. That's just one little thing. But what was the Sabbath for? Genesis 2, God created the heaven and the earth. He rested on the seventh day. Now, God didn't need to rest, by the way. He wasn't tired. He set apart that day for many purposes. Some of them are prophetic, and I won't go into all those today, or we'll be on rabbit trails all day long. But the thing is, he set aside the seventh day, the Sabbath day, Shabbat. He set it aside for man, that it would be a day of rest. He separated it for purpose. But these men, these Jewish leaders, had stacked rule upon rule, law upon law, regulation upon regulation. They had created and made the Sabbath exactly opposite of what God had declared, of what God had purpose for that day. It was to be a day of rest. You don't have to turn there for time's sake. Exodus 20, we read when the Ten Commandments are given to Moses, and understand this, I want to say something else. Genesis 2, we see God creating the heavens and the earth, and He rests, and He declares the seventh day holy and sets it apart. He doesn't command anybody to hold to the Sabbath, not prior to the flood, not after the flood, not the days of Noah, not the days of Abraham, not until the days of Moses, under the Mosaic Covenant, under the law given at Mount Sinai, does he declare any kind of regulation about keeping the Sabbath. And keep that in mind, because it's important. Okay? Keep that in mind. He gave this to Israel for a purpose. And there were sabbatical years, there were all these other things, but he gave them the Sabbath and commanded Israel, under the Mosaic Covenant, under the law, to keep it. Exodus 20, verse 8 says this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of, your, of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It was for rest. One day in seven, it was for rest. You know, Deuteronomy, by the way, Deuteronomy, that book, that means second law, that word. And if you read Deuteronomy chapter 5, I won't go into that because it's essentially the exact same thing we read here, but Deuteronomy meaning second law, remember that's when Moses was giving the law to a second generation after the first generation was dying out. He reiterated this to the second generation, Deuteronomy, second law. But then in Leviticus, in the chapter 23 where we receive, where we, the Jews received all the instruction about the Feast of the Lord, we read this, he reiterates it. Six days, verse 3 says, shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And so we know this, the biblical Sabbath is Saturday. It's Saturday. For the Jews, it's sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And it's a beautiful thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to understand something else. Uh, prior to the flood, the things that happened after the flood, we don't even know for sure if we're on the right calendar. Do you know we don't even know when it's Saturday if it's really Saturday? Do you know that? I just want to throw that out there. Because there's no real clear record of that. Okay? The Babylonian captivity, there were a bunch of things that happened there. In any case, it is Saturday. The Sabbath of the Lord is Saturday, the seventh day. And that'll come back into play as well. But that's the day the creator of the universe used as a day of rest. He sanctified it for his purpose. And then he gave it to the nation Israel under the Mosaic law, under the covenant, for them to rest. But because of religion, because of abuse, because of the rejection of God's word, what happened? The religious people had made it a day of absolute exhaustion. The exact opposite of what God intended. Do you understand? That's what religion does. Man-centered religion, those things based in our thoughts and our feelings and our rules, our laws, all of our dogma, it does the opposite of what God wants. They were exhausting a nation. They were exhausting a people for centuries. They lumped all these laws and regulations. And I thought it would be helpful to give you some of those. Some of them are just outright crazy. 
Some of them are kind of funny, but I want to share with you some of the laws and the rules that Jewish leaders added over time to the Sabbath. Most of these are uh, Christ time or before, some are after, and some are even modern, but I just thought it would give you a good perspective, okay? Listen to this. Um, men were not allowed to carry anything, okay? Not in their hands. They couldn't drape anything over their shoulders, on their chest, or any other way. However, there was a loophole. You could carry something as long as it wasn't more than the weight of a dried fig. And you couldn't carry it in your hand. You had to carry it on the back of your hand, on your foot or your elbow, also in your ear or in your hair or in the hem of your shirt, <laughs> okay? You also couldn't tie your sandals or your shoes because you weren't supposed to tie knots. That was work and that was breaking the law and that was sinful. But loophole, because they were always finding loopholes, women, you were allowed to at least carry one bucket of water. <laughs> but... <laughs> You couldn't tie knots, so how are you going to get the water? Well, there was an exception about tying knots. Women could die, tie their girdles. <laughs> That's one of the rules. I'm not kidding. Women could tie their girdles. So you know what the women would do? Loophole. They would tie their girdle to the bucket, and they would tie their girdle to the rope, and they were lower down to get their water and take it home. That wasn't work. That wasn't sin. But if they would have tied a knot in that rope, that would have been sin. Huh. You couldn't throw an object from one hand and catch it in the other. That's sin. That's work. But you could throw an object up and catch it in the same hand. That wasn't sin. You were not allowed to walk more than 2,000 steps minus one. I already mentioned that. But they made a loophole. If you placed food or some item from your home within that 1,999 steps, the day before the Sabbath, you could walk to that item and then you got another 1,999 steps. It was like bonus. Okay? It wasn't sin for you if you did that. It was only sin if you walked more than those 1,999 steps. They came up with 39 separate categories of work you were not to do. And every one of those categories had volumes of what you couldn't do within each category. They had laws of carrying, as I mentioned, but also of burning. You couldn't kindle a fire on the Sabbath. You couldn't even throw a toothpick into the embers of your fire lest it should start on fire. That would be sin. You would be sinning. You would be breaking. You couldn't light a match. The modern equivalent, though, to this is you couldn't kindle a fire. You can't start your car. Okay, you can't flick on a light switch. That's kindling a fire. If you go to Israel today, you also will find out, if you're in Jerusalem, especially on the Sabbath, on Shabbat, and you're staying on the 20th floor of a uh, hotel, you're going to learn really fast about Shabbat elevators. Well, actually, not very fast. <laughs> it's kind of its own method of rest, if you know what I mean. Because you know what they do with Shabbat elevators in all of uh, Jerusalem and Israel? From Friday sundown to Friday, uh, Saturday sundown, the elevators stop at each floor and open and close and open and close so that you can't push the button and you, they won't work. The buttons won't work because that's work and that's sin and you'd be sinning and so they have Shabbat elevators. They created laws about riding. Oh, by the way, fires, you could extinguish a fire but only if it was your house burning down. <laughs> Thank you, you know. Um, they created laws about riding. You couldn't write, you couldn't stamp. In modern times, you can't use a keyboard. This also meant you couldn't erase anything or destroy documents, which means I guess the government couldn't work on that day, you know. <laughs> um, they got so radical about it that even if a book was stamped on the edges, you couldn't open that book because that would be work. But if it wasn't stamped, you could open that book. They had laws against cooking and eating. Edersheim, in his book, The Life and Time of Jesus, the Messiah, he goes into some of this. And let me read you this excerpt. This is one of their rules about eating. If a man swallowed foods, food the size of an olive and rejected it, and again eaten of the size of a half an olive, he wouldn't be guilty because the palate had tasted altogether a whole olive. So what he's basically saying is if you took a bite of an olive, a full olive, and you spit it out of your mouth, you could only take a bite of a half an olive next time because if you didn't, you'd be tasting the full palate of the olive and that would be sin. That's how my, the minutia of these laws is radical. It's amazing. It's crazy. Um, this also meant there were laws of selecting food. If you were eating a bowl of berries and some of them were rotten, you couldn't pick them out. You had to just pick the good ones and eat those. Now, if there was something that fell into your food that wasn't edible, <laughs> just listen to this. You couldn't remove it from your food unless you removed an equal size of food the amount of whatever fell into your food, a rock falls into your porridge, you have to remove the same amount of porridge of the rock or else it's sin. Okay? 
Okay. Um, and then there were rules about water. You're like, gee, so how long are you going to go on? Well, I just want to give you a taste of this. But there were rules about water. Cold water could not be poured on warm water, of course. You know, that's not sin. That's fine. But warm water, if it's pulled on cold water, was sin. And you were breaking the Sabbath. They had laws against washing. You couldn't wash garments. There was no stain removal. If you spilled food on your chest, on your shirt, you couldn't even touch it. You had to leave it there. You couldn't wring out a garment. You couldn't sew anything. There was no tearing of cloth. In modern times, there was no stapling and fastening of documents. And you couldn't kill anything, which meant if you were getting stung by mosquitoes and bit by mosquitoes, you couldn't swat them. If flies were buzzing around, you couldn't swat them. And in Jesus' day, they even had this rule, and it still exists today, don't examine your clothing, because if you find a lice or a bug in your clothing, you'd be tempted to kill it, and that's sin. You couldn't bathe. You couldn't clean anything. Nothing could be sold, nothing could be bought, no matter what. They also had whole categories about planting, reaping, harvesting, threshing, and winnowing crops. This meant it was considered work. If you picked grain, rubbed it in your hands, blew off the chaff, and then ate the grain. Because you were breaking all the laws of winnowing, all the laws of threshing, the laws of harvesting and selecting, you were breaking their laws. And so back to our passage today in Mark 2. When Jesus is walking through the grain fields and his disciples are picking the grain, rubbing it in their hands, blowing off the chaff and eating it, and these Pharisees are angry. How dare this man and his people break our Sabbath laws? We're going to kill him. We're going to kill him. But I also, look at verse 25, because this, this must have really gotten to their egos. Think about this. Here's this redneck rabbi, right? This man from Galilee, this guy from Nazareth, this little village that was, had a horrible reputation, is coming to them, and he's looking at the Pharisees, the keepers of the law. And he looks at them and says, Have you never read? <laughs> You've got to understand something. These are the Pharisees. These are the men who memorized the entire Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. These are the men who knew the Scripture inside and out. At least they thought they did. You see, here's another warning for us. We can study, we can read, but if there's no practical application, if we don't know, if we don't have the Holy Spirit to help us apply those things, it's worthless. It's just knowledge. Head knowledge will not save you. A lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. I guess I'm a little shorter, maybe it's 17, but from the, your brain to your heart. It's another lesson for you and I. We need to be those that not only study the Word of God, but apply it into our own lives. Let the Word of God slice and dice and do what it has to do. But these men knew the Scriptures. They knew it inside and out. And when Jesus said, so think about it, when He looked at them and said, Have you never read? Could you imagine their faces at that moment? you imagine their anger and their hatred? Because they had read the Scriptures. But then Jesus gives them this example. 1 Samuel chapter 21, again, you don't have to turn there, but there's another famous story, the story of David. Remember, David is the rightful king of Israel, but David was being humble. He wasn't usurping authority. He was doing what God called him to do. But Saul, the king, wanted to kill him, threw a spear at him, right? And then Jonathan, David's best friend, who happens to be King Saul's son, warns David and says, you better get out of here, you better flee. My dad's going to kill you. <laughs> and so David flees with his men. And they go north to a city, uh, this little place called Nob. It's where the tabernacle was north of the city of Israel, of the old city, of Jerusalem, pardon me. He goes there and he's hungry and he needs sustenance. And he goes to Abiathar, the, the high priest, and he says, do you have anything to eat? And he says, the only thing I have is the holy showbread. And it's not lawful for men to eat. But have your men stayed pure from women? And have you, have you stayed pure? And he said, yes, we have. We've made a vow. And so Abiathar says, here, have the showbread. And Jesus refers to this story because he's alluding to the fact that it is lawful to do good, even when man thinks it's wrong, because God is the one who determines what is good and what is bad. God determines our intent, knows our intent. We don't, we don't even know our own intent half the time, right? But God knows our hearts. God is the one who makes the rules, not man. That's what Jesus is saying here. And then he drops one of the biggest truth bombs in all of world history, but he kept, because he tells them something so powerful, so amazing. He says this in verse 27 and 28. He says, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man 
and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. That's pretty powerful. And so remember, the day of Sabbath, that Shabbat was made for a, as a day of rest, one day in seven, for his people to relax, to rest. It was made for man's benefit. But what had religion done to it? It had become the most overtaxing, exhausting, religious controlling day of the week. And Jesus just called him out for it. And not only that, he declared he himself is the Lord of the Sabbath. Do you understand that? That's a messianic title, by the way, when he says he is uh, the Son of Man. They knew exactly what he was declaring, even if we still argue about this stuff. The Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying. But this was their day to rule. This was their day to control, to force every Jew and even most Gentiles, every Pharisee, every Sadducee, every scholar, and every scribe. They were all forced to, to bend their knee under the rule of the Pharisees and all these uh, Shabbat rules, all these Sabbath rules. And Jesus just looks at them, and I'm paraphrasing. This is the Marty version again. He says, no, nope, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because he's telling them, I rule the Sabbath. Jesus just told the Pharisees, he was Lord of the Sabbath. You don't rule it. Again, this is the main reason they wanted to kill him. But just know this. If Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath, he is what says what is illegal and what's legal on the Sabbath. If Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath, he tells us what's offensive and what's not offensive, what we can and can't do. He determines the laws of the Sabbath and not anyone else. I'm just going to read this in narrative form, verses 1 through 6, because these stories of the, these two events of the Sabbath are back-to-back -back in most of the Gospels, I think in three of them, and for a reason, because it's pretty powerful. This reveals their hearts even more. Look at this. Chapter 3, verse 1. And he, speaking of Jesus, entered into the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely. <laughs> Look at their hearts. They're just looking for Jesus to do something they can protest. Whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Verse 3, And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to them, he's looking at the Pharisees now, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? You know, even in their own Sabbath laws, if one of your animals fell into a ditch, you could save them. And they were okay with that, but they're not okay if Jesus heals a man, you see the hardness of the heart? It's pretty crazy. Verse 4, then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, and I have to stop there for a second, understand, this is Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. He is the Word made flesh. He created the Bible, the entire scriptures. They're His scriptures. And He's looking at the men He entrusted with the Word of God for His nation Israel. He's looking at the very men that He appointed, that He trusted to be the keepers of His law. But they had, what had they done? They had violated it. They had twisted it. So imagine His heart. He's angry. But he's grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. <laughs> wow. You know, pay no attention to the fact that he just made a withered hand in front of their eyes. He made a withered hand grow back and, and reshape and reform. Do you understand? Jesus just healed this man with a withered hand and it went back to normal in front of their eyes, but they didn't care because he violated their Sabbath according to their rules. And you know, we still see this stuff today, you know, in the Jewish culture for sure, but also in the Christian culture. You know, you need to know this, but there are a whole Christian groups out there who believe that you and I, by worshiping on Sunday, by coming together on Sunday, that we are the whore of Babylon. I'm not kidding. There are whole churches out there that call themselves Christians that also believe Sunday worship for the church is the mark of the beast. There are Messianic believers out there that I just love, these Messianic believers, but they are guilty of the same thing of the Pharisees. They just keep adding all of this stuff on the Sabbath and all these rules for Christians to follow, and they don't realize all the verses in the Scripture that tell us that's sinful. It's Jesus plus nothing. 
By grace alone, through faith alone. That's how we're saved. But you know, I'll often, I don't know if you guys know this about me, sometimes I'm a little, you know, sarcastic. I know that it probably comes as a real shock. Just pray for me, I'm working on it. But the thing is, is, you know, I'll often talk to folks like that and I'll say, well, what, then why do you make your clergy work on the Sabbath? If it's such a day of rest and you're obeying it, why do you have to get all dressed up and all cleaned up and do all these things and tie your knot and your tie? And why do you kindle a fire starting your car and driving to church and you turn on the lights and you make your clergy work and it's a day of exhaustion, it sounds like. <laughs> they usually don't respond well, so I've, I've tried to soften that method a little. But then also, you know, I will say things like this. Have you never read? <laughs> I'll just use what Jesus said, right? I get the kind of, they don't try to kill me, at least they might want to, but, um, but you know, honestly what I do is I usually take them to John chapter 1, a passage that I often quote, and it'll be on the screen, because this is so crucial for us to understand. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And verse 14 says this, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is the Creator. That's right. I agree. What does that mean? He is the one who rested. Jesus Christ created the entire universe in six days. He is the one who rested on the seventh. He is the very one who set aside the seventh day, made it holy. Do you get I mean, He is the one who created the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, but He created the Sabbath. I think we should probably listen to what He has to say about the Sabbath. What do you think? Do you realize that? When you look at this opposition, these Pharisees, these religious people, standing in opposition to the Creator of the universe, the one who had created the entire universe, the one who had made the Sabbath, and they're arguing with him about what's legal and what's not legal on the Sabbath. I don't know about you. I find it a little funny. Maybe I'm just, a, that's something I need to work on too. But you know, the other thing about that is, remember, Jesus declared to us, we looked at this last week, that he came to do something new. He came to do a brand new work. He didn't come to do away with the Mosaic Law. He came to fulfill it. But he was bringing something new, a new covenant, a new beginning. And I want us to understand this. In the Bible, seven is the number of completion, perfection. He created the earth in six days, rested on the seventh. It was a perfect week. But what's the number of new beginnings? Do you know? Eight. The Bible has a lot to say about the eighth day. What day do we worship on? The eighth day. But I mean, as far as coming together as a church, don't get ahead of me. Some of you, I like that. But... It's the eighth day. It is the first day of the week, but it's also the eighth day when you understand what the eighth day principle is. Because of this, what day did our Lord Jesus Christ come out of the tomb? Sunday, the eighth day, the new day, the new wineskin, the new wine. He did something new. He fulfilled the law. It was the first day of the week, but technically the eighth. Now, here's another thing. You hear all these things about people that say Constantine in 313 AD, when he made the official uh, religion of Rome, Christianity, he changed uh, Sabbath, and now the church started to meet on Sunday. That's hogwash, okay? That's baloney, okay? Um, here's the thing. You go read the early church fathers, first and second century. They all talk about the principle of the eighth day, not all of them, some of them I should say, but they talk about how the church gathered on the first day of the week. Not just that, don't, don't just trust that, go search that out yourself. But we also know in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, it tells us that the church gathered together on Sunday, on the first day of the week, on Resurrection Sunday, to collect offerings for the church. They came together. Not only that, in Acts chapter 20 we read they came together on the first day of the week to celebrate communion, to break bread together, and to fellowship. Do you understand that? It was on Sunday. Why? Because they were celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The eighth day, the new day, the new wineskin. But not just that, what day was the church born on? Pentecost. Amen. Pentecost is 50, it means 50. It was 50 days after the Sabbath, after the Passover. 49 days plus one. Seventh Sabbath plus one which means the day of Pentecost, the very day the church was born, the very day the Holy Spirit was given to the church, was Sunday. 
Not only was it Resurrection Day, but it's the day the church was born. Not only is it, is it celebrated as the eighth day, it's the day the church came together to collect offerings. It's the, it's the day the church came together to break bread in the New Testament. Don't take my word for it. Study it out. Test it with the Scripture. Like I said, he, he brought a new wineskin. But this is the thing we need to remember. The Sabbath was made for you and I. And so when people try to put a trip on us and try to tell us that we need to be worshiping on Saturday and that that is the Sabbath that Christians need to keep, remember this. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the creator of the Sabbath. He determines what the Sabbath is. And one thing you've got to keep in mind is in the New Testament Scripture, every single one of the laws of Moses, the covenant, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, every single one of them is reconfirmed they're all moral laws. It's, do you know it's still sin to murder people? Do you, do you know that? It's still sin to commit adultery, to steal, to covet. It's still sin. Those are all reaffirmed in the New Testament. The only one that's not specifically reaffirmed of those ten is what? The Sabbath. However, we're going to see at the very end of this, and I'll try to get there, that Jesus Christ did something very special about that Sabbath. Okay? Now, the other thing I don't want to get sideways is this. God's not done with Israel. We talk about this a lot. The Mosaic Covenant has been fulfilled, but God's not done with Israel. And we know the time of the tribulation is all about Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. But understand this. There's not two covenants in play here. How is Israel going to be saved? How is any Israeli, how is any Hebrew still saved right now? The New Covenant, Jesus Christ. So remember that and understand that. There isn't, the Mosaic Covenant is, still not, is not still here for Israel. They're under the New Covenant as well. They just don't know it yet. As a whole, anyway. But I always come to this question. People ask me, so should we rest on the Sabbath? I say, it's a good principle. If you want to rest on Saturday, do it. One day in seven, you should rest. It's given for you. It's given for man. But what day should we worship then? I think I said, or somebody said it earlier. Every day. As Christians, we should worship every day. Remember in the early church, they also met day by day. Every day in the houses. And they fellowshiped together. Every day. But, but this is key. Let me read you this. And like I said, we've got a couple more verses here to, to cover. But if you grasp this last part of the teaching, if you really grasp it, um, some of you, like I said, probably already have. But I know when, this, when God put this and leapt off the page at me, it changed my entire Christian walk. And I just hope I can do it justice. But Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says this. Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding festivals or new moons or Sabbaths, which are a shadow, a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So that gets us pointed in the right way. And we need to understand something. That ceremonial system, that sacrificial system, under the Mosaic law, under the covenant, the Aaronic priesthood, all of that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And when we understand what he really did, when we understand, it should really, truly blow your mind. Because Jesus is not only Lord of the Sabbath, He's not only the creator of the very Sabbath day, He is the Sabbath. He Himself is the Sabbath day. He is our Sabbath day. He is our Sabbath rest. Hebrews chapter 4, I challenge you to study this out on your own, but verse 1 says this, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. But look at this. this is the ver these are the verses that changed my whole life. Verses 8 through 10 says this, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Another day that was coming. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Do you see what it's saying there? And don't placate me, don't, don't shake your head yes if you, if you don't. Study this out, because when you realize what this is really saying, it will change your life. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all things, he is our Sabbath rest. He's not only Lord of the Sabbath. He's not only the one who created it. He's not only the one who established it and sanctified it. But He is literally our Sabbath day. Our Sabbath rest. In Him we find rest. 
In him, we cease from our futile works. Do you understand that? In him, in the gospel, it's a free gift. We enter into his rest. He is literally our Sabbath day. And so I want to answer those questions. What day is the biblical Sabbath? Well, the day he hallowed is Saturday. I have no problem with that. But it's not even really a valid question for Christians. When we ask that question, what day is the biblical Sabbath? For you and I, if we abide in him and he in us, it's every day. Amen. Second question, are Christians bound to observe the Sabbath? It's not a valid question. It's our condition. Do you understand that? Do you really understand that? Christians are not bound to observe the Sabbath because we're living in it. We are in the Sabbath. Him. He is the Sabbath. And then the third, what day should the church worship the Lord? We've already answered it. Every single day of our lives. That's who He is. And when you understand that, you understand the passage, the verse, when Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, maybe you're one of these Christians that just beat yourself up all the time. Everything's based on works. You think you have to earn it. You're constantly trying to earn it. You're constantly trying to be good enough. You're constantly trying to do all these things. Stop. Let Him empower you to live the life you're called to live. Walk in, dive in to his Sabbath rest. He is Lord of the Sabbath, but he is the Sabbath. Father God, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, that we can enter into rest from our futile works. Lord, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And Lord, we know that we're saved by this new covenant, this new work, the eighth day, something brand new. And we know, Lord, that you came to fulfill the old system, the old covenant. And all of those things were just a shadow to point all of us to you. And so, God, we just ask that this would be a reality in our lives. And, Lord, as we get ready for communion, let us ponder these things. Let us think about what it truly means to enter your rest. Let us remember the words you said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We praise you and we honor you, Lord Jesus. We seek you today like never before. We ask that you pour out your spirit upon us. And Lord, get our hearts and our minds ready for communion. In Jesus' name, amen.